nah, don't try it. You can't feed me lies, won't buy it. Question everything, tell them, nah, don't try it. Yeah, we are moving like some psychic. We are moving like some waste, man. Trying to impress me, won't like it. Be a soft man, please don't try it. Really, why do they always... So, Henny, you were the youngest female to join the European tour as an amateur, right? Yeah. How was that for you? Because, I mean, even for me as a footballer, when I made my debut as a kid, it was like the best feeling ever, but really nerve-wracking. So what was it like for you? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, at the time, I was just spotting all my stars, all of my heroes. <laughs> I just thought it was the best thing ever. I had no expectations. I thought if I made the cut, that would be insane. I didn't. Um, but there was no game prep. There was no what I'm going to achieve. It was just oh my goodness, this is such an incredible opportunity and there's Paola Marti, there's Trish Johnson, there's Laura Davis, oh my gosh. Um, so I think I just lapped it all up and it was my first time being in a professional tour environment and that was what I wanted to aspire to but then actually seeing it and being immersed in it, I was like, this did is it, just did, amazing. Did you embrace it or was you like really nervous when you teed off? I wasn't super nervous because I didn't have any expectations of like, this is what I want to achieve. But the first I just box. thought... I, I think, I think when, when you're that <laughs> young, know. you're oblivious to it, aren't you? Yeah, you just I was get so on with young, it. I was just like, this is great. It's like yeah. when I think back about flights now when I was a kid. Yeah. And I had some really awful flights, like being able, unable to land in storms and stuff. I wasn't nervous. I was just chatting to all my mates. So now I'd be death gripping yeah, the seat. <laughs> I mean, so I think you don't have that level of fear when you're younger. Um, but it's really interesting. I say it's interesting because now if I think back, if I think to some of the young kids that are doing what they're doing in women's golf at 13, like they're looking, they're competing. They're yeah. out there looking to win. There's like a serious level of prep there yeah. that I just didn't have back in the day. Yeah, you just want um, to enjoy the occasion. Yeah, yeah. So literally my only memories of those two there was two weeks one in Portugal one in Ireland is looking at Sophie Gustafsson and Laura Davis Trish Johnson and Paola Marti and a little bit of the golf courses but that's my memory just seeing my heroes so what, what was like your, your, your mum and dad like because you know for me like I mean my, my mum was a cleaner my dad was working for British Telecom at the time and they used to get me everywhere but obviously there was you know I wouldn't say broke but we came from a poor background and I play football where you don't really need money. You just need something round. You throw your bags <laughs> down. You've got a goal. You've got something round that you can compete with with, yeah. your, with your little friends. But obviously, golf is a more middle class sport and it's more expensive. Yeah. So, like, how was that for you growing up? Yeah, really interesting because like, I also come from a very, very poor background. Um, mm. My mum, when she was an immigrant into this country, was working like three different jobs, couldn't afford wow. to put food on the table for all of us. Um, she did incredibly well, put herself through education, doing amazing now. But at the time, yeah, like if we wanted a toothbrush, we'd have to wait like a few weeks. Yeah. And um, so I think it's really interesting because I was talking about this recently with someone that in golf, you look at what other people are doing to be able to sort of act that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're like the master of code switching and getting yeah. into that environment and being like okay this is how I'm at gala dinner now or... this is how I should yeah. act this is what I should do um so there's all of that stuff to try and figure out and to this day my mum will call me on a Saturday and be like how was round one and I'm like no no <laughs> we've been through this <laughs> Thursday through Sunday she's yeah. like oh yeah um so just like completely oblivious on the golf front um but you know I think that as you probably know, like, that's what makes you. And I think my unique background compared to everyone else in golf at the time gave me a little bit of an edge and a little bit more fight and grit and determination. Yeah. Um, we always talk about that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Like, I think, I mean, especially in my industry where I was playing football, back then you, it, you needed that hunger. Yeah. I think in this, some, in this day and age, I think especially, like, kids of ex-professionals, it's almost like they got that safety blanket. A hundred percent. Where they, where they, where they, where they feel they like they don't care if they don't. They don't perform, care as really. much, yeah, yeah, because they know that they've got something to fall back on. Whereas, mm. like now, the kids that really make it are the ones that come from mm. backgrounds like yourselves, like mine, um, Trey's, of course. Um, I saw a meme recently that was like, "How do I raise my kids right but give them just enough trauma to yeah. make yeah. them hungry?" <laughs> that was funny. I'm just saying this. Like, my mum used to give me some licks. Like when, <laughs> when I used to do some stuff, now it's like, you can't do that. Mm. And then you know, I, for me, it's just like I feel like, how can you really discipline 
a child. I bet that's what you're like now. No, I'll never like. <laughs> I'll never. You know, I'll never like raise my hand. Like I, you know, my mum used to say, "Choose a slipper. Choo- what do you want today? The slipper or the belt? Mm. Depending on how bad I've been." But like now, it's just like I, I've raised my voice, and then he knows. Like okay. Mm. You know, but back yeah. then there was more, much more discipline involved in yeah. upbringing, I think. It's really interesting, though, because my daughter, I think because of the way that it's very similar, like I ne- never touch her and I barely yeah. even raise my voice to her. But she's so emotionally intelligent and so aware of her feelings Like we were playing with these little colour monsters and she goes to talking to her. They're all different emotions <clears throat> and represented by different colours. And she's talking to one of them and she goes, it's OK to feel sad. Like, just feel your feelings. And I'm like, wow, that's going to be insane to watch her grow up and in sport be a, that have that yeah. level of emotional awareness to be yeah, able already. to just... Yeah, yeah already. It's crazy. It's so, all about meditation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, like, I'm really big on meditation. You know, I, as, I always say this, and I'm sure people are going to get bored of me saying this, but I always view <laughs> success is a sword, a double-edged sword, that you can't blunt one end without blunting the other one. And so if you take away that harshness that I had growing up, which I probably have done a lot of it, you don't get that same level of like fierce determination, drive, mm. focus, tunnel vision of, for me, golf was a way out. Yeah. That was yeah. my vehicle that out was of with me, yeah. where how, I was. Yeah. How did you get into it then? Because I always ask this to everybody because everyone's got a different story and it's like, it's not one of them sports that you will just easily kind of fall into usually it's like football like your typical ones like for you how was it how did you get into my mum took me and my brother um to this like summer golf school at Orchard Lee um and it's so funny because I was in the studio recently with Johnny Morgan and he was there at Orchard Lee and so I've known him since I was nine years old the golf industry is crazy it's so small um so friendly though so friendly yeah yes good that's one thing I would say experience both for me the golf world is so... Compared to football. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Like, football is like everyone wants to keep everything for themselves. Whereas in golf, it's like, oh, you know, come here, do this. I can do this for you. Yeah. Which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it, it's talking about kids. Like, that's the only reason I want to get my daughter into golf because I feel like it gives you so many life skills. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, true. As you get older, you don't have to be great at it. It just gives you a really good foundation. Um, but yeah, we did the summer golf camp and then the guy there was like, it's a tea peg series in the South that you should give a go because your kids are you know doing really well and enjoying it and this was a it's brilliant I don't know if it's still going but it was you got level one you could use a tee anywhere fairway (laughs) tee rough level two you could only use a tee in the rough and on the tee and level three just on the tee box and the main memory that I have is like just making so many little friends and we went round every competition Mm. and we have little like chipping putting competitions for bowl of chips and a coke and whatever and it was a really nice <laughs> yeah. little social and then we just kind of went from there and at what it point was... did you feel like okay I've got something here I'm better than the rest I think just like winning things when you yeah. start winning things I don't think there was any like defining moment but I entered the, I won the first competition that I entered of the T-Peg series and I was like oh that's cool I like winning I was <laughs> this is fun. Playing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then I just kept winning, and then I just—I I think I was just naturally sporty, mm. and so whatever sport I went to, I think I would have taken to it. And it just so happened that I, I like the individual individuality of golf, that I could control it. I think especially growing up yeah. poor, you're not in control of anything, and so out on the golf course, you can create your own story. And I used to think of it as a book. Mm front nine front six and then you know I I wrote all the pages that was my domain my world no matter what was going on and I had a really tough childhood actually so how did you get golf clubs um that's a good question my mum bought me a little set Vantage um where's your mum from I had a cut down nine iron that she had (laughs) where's your mum from she's on Mauritius okay um, that's came a, over to tell England. You that's a beautiful place to go to. You know, it's 14 yeah. hours away, but... Really? Yeah, it's unreal. Yeah. Do you know what the thing was? When I was looking at it on the map, I was thinking, oh, that's going to be about eight hours, something like that. And then I got told it was 14. I was like, I might have to hold fire here before yeah. I go there. <laughs> it's worth it, though. It's worth it every minute of the 14-hour flight. Yeah, she came over to England when she was 18, so... Okay. Um, so you had cut-down clubs. Cut-down clubs, and then a little set of Vantage, and then I got... Which was like a half set. Yeah, yeah. And then I got down to single figures on my half set and then oh, I got yeah. a sponsorship by Ping and um, 
and then you was like, yeah. So I'm well, no, but I didn't now. use half of the clubs because I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> yeah, that was, that I got my six. first full set and I was like, what are these wedges? I, I had a 9.75 and a pitching wedge before and then I added in a little three iron that always found in like the bargain bucket. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, that well, the three iron was like my pride and joy. And then I got this full set and I didn't touch any of the wedges. I distinctly remember not having the confidence of using a 52 degree mm. until I was like well into my teens. Wow. Had them for like a year but or two. To be, and didn't to be touch honest, them. that's just like breed skill for me, like being able to use, play good golf with half a set of clubs. You know, if you've ever done that three club challenge? No. And go around, you, you've heard three club yeah, challenge yeah. around your course. Sometimes only you do a competition. Three clubs. three clubs only. You play 18 holes. So you've got to play so many different shots with three clubs. You wouldn't take a driver then, would you? you got to you got to be tactical. You've got to yeah. pick, wow. pick your clubs. It's your choice. Your choice. Is this including putter as well? Yeah. Yeah, three clubs and a putter. <laughs> you wouldn't take putter. <laughs> no, no. You, you You'd put it with like a, a two-iron or a three-iron, right? or something like yeah. that. Yeah. You can putt yeah. with that one of those, no? Yeah. Any yeah. iron, you can. Yeah, yeah. You could just middle it. But like that is, if you went round and you had the same round as you did with 14 clubs as you did with three, you've got some, some pretty good skill skills, to do yeah. that. So we'll have to try that one day. Yeah, three club challenge. Yeah, love and he can come and do that one as well. Yeah, a band special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is like growing up with, with like Sevy with a three iron, isn't it? Like playing bunker yeah. shots and playing all these different shots. Yeah, when I see that, I was like, wow, this guy's got something. But this is what I was saying. Like, to me, when I speak to all these pros like now, and I say, do you think the pros back then are more skillful? But they have to be, right? Because they can't hit the ball as far. Yeah. So you have to rely on skill, right? Which for me would mean that those golfers then could live with the golfers today because they would have better, better technology. They would be able to hit the ball further, but then they have the skill to get out of mm. difficult situations more. Yeah, it's interesting. There's so many different levels to it. I think definitely when the groove changes came in, that, bought, that widened everything, plus hybrids mm. and technology of the drivers and the, them being able to get out there. I think that widened the net, if you like. Um, but then if you think about the speed of the greens back then, they were like so fuzzy. Yeah, Would yeah, those guys yeah. be able to hang at Augusta now with the speed of those greens? That's a whole yeah, another like skill in and of itself. Right. Yeah, it would be so interesting though to superimpose and bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> but them. like Rory hit that. Uh, did you see Johnny Morgan give Rory that? Um, he, sh we sh he showed it you on the range yeah, last yeah. week actually, that old driver. Yeah. He's always carrying something around. And he gave it Rory to it on one of the tees and they trap manned it and he was like. Yeah, it was like 255 carry with the old thing, and then he hit his back at like 308, like 310. It's amazing, I think, the difference between that and... Like, you think he, he's a skillful player. the courses player. would be short as well, right? Yeah. yeah the courses yeah. obviously yeah. short. It's, it's, important, it's a big debate. I mean, like, it's, like, it's, I guess, I mean it's like football, to be honest. Like, everyone talks about the boots being much lighter, mm. the yeah. pitches being much better. Are the balls different? The balls sure. are different. That was, uh, football back in the day was just like a big piece of leather. <laughs> You know, so it's like it was it was much, much harder. But then I still feel like the players today, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Is there it's hard to say as well because I've seen these players today. I haven't seen those players with my own mm. eyes mm. and I've played against some of them. So it, I think there's a bit, it's a bit different. But I think the best players then could play now, but I'm just not sure how good they would be now. Yeah. Mm. But I think they'll definitely be like professional playing in the Premier League, but would they be a world superstar? I'm not sure. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm. But that's eras, so, isn't it? That's eras and everything. It's difficult, difficult to compare eras. Yeah. You can't, it's like boxing, isn't it? You're like, the boxers back in the day, like, would they compete with boxers back now? Because heavyweight skill is skill though, right? But all the divisions yes. are different. That's the thing. They? That's what I'm saying. Skill yeah. is skill, right? It doesn't matter what era you're in. Mm. I think the top few would always be the top few always but yeah. I think the technology is wide in the net yeah, yeah. It changes, to be able yeah. to have more Definitely. people come in yeah. what was it like um growing up obviously um in golf like being a female um a black female black female did you ever notice any struggles or anything that was like wow this is not a sport I can make do you feel a certain of, way yeah like I'm, yeah, yes, yes. Now, let me give you an example. Like, there's certain courses I've played at, especially like the stuffy ones. I could just be in a car park and, you know, you get the side eye and kind of like look up and down yeah. that kind of way. <laughs> yeah. It makes me feel like, it makes me feel uncomfortable to be. Yeah. I, I prefer you to be racist to my face than give me that side <laughs> eye. Like, what are you doing there? Yeah, I think, um, yes, of course. Mm. Uh, and I've spoken on it quite a bit, but I think mm. my personality is very, if you tell me I can't do something or be somewhere, I'm going to show up every fucking day and be mm. there. 
I like that. that's me. I love that. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, so I just think I used it as like motivation, and still to this day, you know, being a woman and black in this industry, still facing things and still having firsts and still breaking through barriers and like. Yes, it's cool. It's also really exhausting sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was in America when the George Floyd murder happened and working oh, wow. in broadcasting and hosting town hall meetings for the industry and speaking out on it. And all that stuff's incredible to be in that position. But also you get to the point where you're like, Sorry. I'm exhausted. Yeah. I, don't, I just want to be a broadcaster. I don't want to have to think about all mm. this stuff. I don't want to have to lead the charge. I don't want to have to be a, you know be seen as a woman or a black woman and yeah. sometimes when you, you see are. these like you I know, have that position where you're I, like it's such you're a, so big sometimes in the game. it's such a big weight of responsibility yeah, exactly, and I'm yeah. I really cherish that and I'm so grateful for that and I get these incredible messages from young girls and young black girls mm. and who can relate to me and they say thank you and it's you know if you can't see someone in that position you can't be that yeah, and I course. don't take that lightly at all but sometimes just being real and honest it mm. is exhausting awesome. and sometimes I just wish like that the environments could be built for someone like me and how that would feel yeah because you know when you see all the older white men that are in that right now the environment's built for them so when they go to work they feel super comfortable every single day like how I feel talking to you guys yeah, super comfortable yeah. right I'm late today I don't care because it's my people yeah, and I know right? that you guys are like <laughs> whatever like me and Zane had the same thing I was thing. upset with you to be honest were you? Okay. No, I t I, I, <laughs> you were chilling listening no, to throwback music he was late as well and I said come on Henny's waiting she's getting aggy now and he was like <laughs> shit what? Like, just stop just about stop. me <laughs> <laughs> you're it yeah, but well, it's just well, a different well. language it's a different way of being it's mm. different humour there's so many subtle things about being different in an environment and so sometimes I just feel like oh wouldn't it be so nice if the humor <laughs> if the language if the environment was more comfortable for me mm. and so who was your idol then because obviously there wasn't a lot of black women playing golf at that time right no I mean obviously Tiger at the time yeah and then female wise I love Lorena Ochoa I just love the way that she held herself and yeah. how she showed up in the game um Outside of golf, Muhammad Ali was yeah. wow. my huge idol. Like my first tattoo is a sting like a butterfly, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Really? You're tattooed up, yeah? Yeah. So I yeah. wouldn't even afford that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I just loved him because he stood up for what he believed in. Like mm. regardless of the situation that he found himself in yeah. to he go in prison, he was in his he? prime yeah. and he was giving up so much for what he believed in. Yeah. And you can argue whether that was right or wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that he stood up so strongly for his yeah. belief at the time. And that was insanely inspiring to me. And that, you know, for me to be like, I stand up for yeah, what yeah, I believe in. Do. In golf, to speak out at that time, especially yeah. at that George Floyd, time, George Floyd time about yeah. race. And yeah, I got some insane messages. Like Golf Digest would put up a post with a quote about what I'd say, and I couldn't even look at the comments. They were so vile. Because mm. so golf, do, the environment, is just... How do you handle that in a, like a, you just don't look, you just don't pay attention to yeah, comments? Yeah, because mentally that and, would be like... Stuff. Yeah, I figured out really... you must have got abuse as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I figured out really early on that um, if I listened to the good stuff, like if I was affected by the good comments, I could be affected by the bad comments. So... I couldn't be affected by any comment because it's all subjective and it's all that's, someone's opinion. That's a great, yeah. that's great, man. that's a great saying, you know. Um, mm. So if you think I'm great, that's not my business. And if you think I'm terrible, that's not my business. I used to like reading good things about myself, I can't lie. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah, because it feels good, but then yeah. adversely, then when you read the well. bad know, thing, yeah. that feels bad. So yeah. for me, I just take, take all of that out. Um, and, but then it did get to the point where I was if I had a bad show or a bad moment in the show, I would be going onto Twitter to search for what people were saying about me. And so I deleted Twitter because I was like, I can't. Do you That's do that now with, good with, with broadcasting as well? Yeah, no, I can't, can't really? do that. I've deleted Twitter because I was yeah. like, it's just such, such yeah. a cesspit that... Twitter is one of them weird ones, isn't it? Where it's just like everybody's under things. Just But when you become successful, like that, someone's mm -hmm. always going to have an opinion on you. Always. But it... In my eyes, when I have, whenever I see that and I see those things, it's like 
they're commenting under it because you're in that position mm. doing what you're doing so at the end of the day like you are going to have that and yeah. it's a, it's good but it's 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 bad comments but it's good because you're in that place doing what you're doing so if you wasn't they wouldn't be you wouldn't have any I comments and things i think my industry was a bit different because when you used to play even on the pitch you was getting abuse from fans right mm. there's insane racism yeah exactly in exactly so for me it was it was more like I'm used to that anyway, yeah. but I still w want to hear the good things. Interesting. Yeah, in that, that was just me though. Like, I could block things out. I remember we played, we were just talking about my wife now. Yeah. Like um, we played Verona in a game and I remember the manager um, pulled us in a few times actually. We played Inter Milan and we played Verona and I remember he said to um, me and a few of the other black players, listen, I'm, I, you know, I'm sorry to say this to you, but you're probably going to get racism chance mm. your way on on Sunday and I was like but you know I'm looking at the, the squad list for their team and they've got black players as well uh -huh. so I was like why would they do that and he said it's just to put you off a game they uh -huh. might not necessarily be racist but they're going to do it to put you off a game there are some racist p people and there's there are there are ones that are not racist but they just all together so it's I remember them doing like mentality. monkey chants and all this kind of stuff and when I actually went to meet my wife's parents, I said to my wife, I said, listen, Stella, like, I just need to know, you know, what, what are your parents' views on, on, mm. on black people? And she was like, don't be silly, you know, it's fine. But in my head, I was thinking, you're going to say that yeah. to your mum and dad, you know? Yeah. So when I went there, I was really nervous. But in the end, they were like, fine and fantastic. And they just want their, you know, their daughter to be happy. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So you never quite know though, do you? Like, that's the you're thing. always like, on went, edge slightly sometimes when you're meeting on edge. people yeah. from a certain era. Mm. Yeah. You're like, ugh. Yeah. That's the thing. That, but I mean, that's the, the, the world we live in now, right? Yeah. How did you deal with that when you were playing? Like hearing those chants and... It, uh, like, to the, it's weird because today <clears throat> I see it and it really upsets people. But for me, when I was on the pitch, I didn't want to see that they upset me. Mm. So I'd, I'd just smile. Or say mm. something, or if I scored a goal, I might go over and do that, or like kind of, you know, that kind of gesture that would make them even more upset. But for me, I didn't let it get to me because I still wanted to perform. Mm. You know, I'd speak about it afterwards, especially if someone heard. But there was loads of times I was racially abused. Mm. Like I remember my first piece of racial abuse. We was playing for, um, I think I was like under 15s England, and we played away in in Poland actually. And I remember there was like, hey, black boy, give me the ball, like, but in a kind of aggressive way. And I was like, and at the time, Henny, I was like, my mind was still on the street. So like, I was kind of fiery, like, yeah. I would attack you on the pitch. Mm. And I remember Jermaine Defoe was like, you know, just calm down, you know, yeah. kind of thing. But that was the first time I experienced racism. And it was sad to have it at that age, that they knew they was racist as well. They knew mm. they was doing something yeah. to upset me at 15 years old. It's mad how young it starts, isn't it? Because like my first one was at school. I'm not even related to sport. This little boy called me a packy, and I, <laughs> and I just, <laughs> bloody hell. just had him straight up against the wall. I was like, That's not gonna happen. <laughs> Ruthless. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's insane how young it starts. But conversely, it's also really interesting with my daughter, um, who's like kind of tan skin but blonde hair. I mean, she you'd write white on a form. Like, I bought tons of books because my whole family's black and my sister's mm. got braided hair and big afros mm. and, like, mm. you know, it's within our culture. Um, and already now, like, she's reading a book the other day called um, Black Women... A Black Woman Did That. So it's all the black women through history who, and what they've achieved. And um, I put it away because when she was born, I was like, I don't need to read all of that to her. But then she found it in her wardrobe and she bought it out. And there was... Um, a black woman who had, I can't remember what her exact story was, but it, the, it was a depiction of her fist up in a riot, being going through, fighting for her rights, basically. Mm. And my daughter said, oh, what's that? And I was like, oh, you know, black women have been unfairly treated in the past. And so she's fighting for her rights to be mm. treated fairly. She's like, okay. But like already you can have those conversations with yeah. a two and a half year old and she yeah. understands and... It's, it's really frustrating to me sometimes when I see, especially in America, people saying you can't have those conversations with young kids and you can't talk about race or whatever. And I'm like, of course you can. It's all part of being 
yeah. human. Mm -hmm. She's going to understand those things growing up. and I think you need to know it as well. I said the sooner they know <laughs> about educated, it, isn't it, yeah, it's educating. Yeah. No question, just being able to see, like, all this you don't see colour is wild because mm, yeah. it's important do you think, to do you, see. Do you, Someone said that to me the other day, actually, and I was like, yeah, to, think about to, it. Yeah, to yeah. me, I was like, listen, you're my friend, so I'm going to pull you up on it. But you, yeah. there's certain people you can't say that in front of. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what, what's your thoughts on that? It's interesting because it's something that I said growing up, because obviously being mixed as well, I didn't yeah. understand. And but, yeah. I, I grew up in the era where a gollywog was still a thing. And yeah. Like I got called low, like half cast. Yeah. And things like that. But I didn't, I would probably call myself that growing up because I didn't even know. Yeah. There wasn't that, I grew up in rural England. Like, yeah. rural England. Yeah. Like, there just wasn't the knowledge or the information. There was none of these books. There it's was nothing though. on the yeah. internet, wasn't even like widely available at that point. So it's been a real learning curve for me as well. But I think where I stand on that now is it's actually really important to see race so that you can see how people are treated unfairly mm. and so that you can understand equity rather than equality. Would you pull your friends up on it though? <sighs> yeah, I think yeah. I would. If because someone was like, I just don't see like, colour. Yeah, you, yeah, you don't like, want to be oh, that yeah, person. Like, yeah, like, I don't think, want to be yeah. that, but it's important. I think it's a time and a place. Like if it was in a big group and we're having a big discussion on it, sure. Mm. If it's like an offhand comment, I might pull you aside later mm. on and just be like hey by the way this mm. you know I know you think that on it and I know you're trying to come from a good place but actually this is a different way to think about it that's what I that's what kind of what I did I just said it was just me and him and I just said listen that's cool speaking to me like that mm. because you're my friend mm. I'm going to tell you if you're in a group of people and you say something like that some pipe some people won't like it yeah you know, you know and just then you're going to be in a situation where <clears throat> now you have to explain yourself but I and you know you're not racist yeah mm. Yeah, it's so funny thinking about the things that like we put up with as kids. Yeah, I always. And now I would yeah. never stand for that. Like there was a white boy growing up who would quote um, the Coach Carter film, and be like, "You're not my nigger, you're my bigger nigger." <laughs> and I thought yeah. that was fine because I was like, "That was quite funny." Yeah, but now if a white guy said that to me, I'd be like, "I'm sorry, what? No. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got like, you know, it's funny. Like, do you remember when we were talking about Mexico? Yeah. The first time I went to Cancun, there was this like Hispanic guy, and you know, at the time I'm like 16 years old, so I've I've never had someone call me nigger. Yeah. Just like you know, in a gesture, like a friendly kind of loving way. This guy said it to me, and I was like, my eyes switched. Man. I was like, what's this guy? Because <laughs> he's, he was, he's white as well. Like I know he's Hispanic, but he's white. Yeah. And then he said that to me, and I was like, what? Mm. And then it was kind of like that. He was with a black guy, and he was like, no, 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 no. In America, it's such like it's like this. It's a word of affection between us. And I was like, mm. there's that blackish chart. You see, yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. he's like, white person, no, black person, yes, Hispanic, maybe. Yes. <laughs> it's true, yeah. <laughs> if who can say it and who can't? It's, it's yeah, thing. it is interesting though, like that perspective shift now that we have more information and more knowledge and like. Black culture in England versus black culture in America is just like it's, so it's wildly different. Yeah, different. Do you feel like when you got into, you know, the broadcasting space, do you feel like you had to look a certain way? Or do you feel like you went there just saying, oh, you know, I, this is me, I'm going to... This is such an interesting conversation. To this day, I have, okay, one time, but in studio, I have never worn my hair natural curly. And I really? won't. I, is that, is that, is, is it I feel uncomfortable. Really? I can't quite really? do that. No, I'm not quite there yet. Okay, so we, I'm going to see you there this year though. Yeah, I don't know. All my friends keep saying, my hair, man, it has been such an emotional journey with my hair growing up in England. Like when I was a kid, I couldn't, ha if I had my hair curly big at school, everyone would touch it. Mm. Oh mate, Couldn't that, do was, that. that was the I honestly. Had, I remember I had so my clearly. Like that, no. nah, honestly, I was going for the Michael Jackson bad look. Nah, <laughs> <laughs> you know but I have a like, like recollection of having my head. Like this is the only thing I think about. If you think about hair curly at school, my head on my hands like this on my desk, mm. like distraught because everyone would touch my hair. Mm. And then I had it in braids because I was like, okay, cool, I could mm. do that. That's an easy way of looking after my hair and getting dressed for school in the morning. And I went to a um, Christian school and the headmaster, who is an absolute, the most evil human ever, put me in time out because I went to school with that hairstyle. Wouldn't let me talk to anyone, wouldn't let oh, anybody talk awesome. to me or touch my hair 
until I got it taken out. So it was quite clear that he was racist then. Very, very racist. Mm. But like, I didn't know it at the time. But then you just have all this like shame about your hair. And even then when I was in, um, uh, all I can think of was high school. And I don't know I'm thinking about the American term, secondary school. When mm. I was in secondary school, I had blonde braids and everyone was just always Is that to fit in as like, well? Is that no, I like think I way... was just experimenting with styles because oh, okay, like okay. my sister now, I see her, she loves experimenting with like different yeah. coloured extensions mm. in her braids and I yeah. just thought that was a cool look. But everyone always like wanting to touch it and calling them dreadlocks and like, oh, <laughs> I yeah, still, yeah, I yeah, carry yeah, that yeah, weight yeah. with me. Like I feel stressed mm. talking about it. Yeah. And it's such a, like, it's been such a long journey. It, for this last um, two years, since I've had my daughter, two and a half years, it's the first time I haven't relaxed my hair in my life since I was like seven, wow. I've relaxed it, which is really d dangerous chemicals, by the way. For, like I've had situations of my hair falling out in clumps because I've left relax on too long just to try and straighten it. But the, the hair on TV thing, is that because of what viewers are seeing and, and, or is that because of what people within? No, I think it's like me. Okay, <laughs> like, so it's not, it's you. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think it's me, like it's Kenny. a I wanna, very I deep seated. Can I, can I see that? Will you do it just for me? I can't promise anything, but <laughs> I'm working on When you see Henny with natural hair on TV, then you'll know a liberation has happened. Okay. There's actually, but you know, even to this day, I go into the makeup room when I go to work. You'll know, you've been into the makeup room. Yeah. I physically recoil. <laughs> <laughs> can't improve on perfection. <laughs> but the, you have to wear makeup and you have to get your hair done going into Sky, right? I physically recoil sometimes when there's certain people in there because I know they're not going to straighten my hair and get into the roots properly or like use the straightener strong enough. And then I'll just have my hair tied up. So if you see me with my hair tied up on air, well, it it's because I haven't, I haven't yeah. like had it straightened out properly. I think it's funny as well. Like when, I've, when I've been into obviously the studios and have had makeup put on me, there's certain people that do it really Bad, like like, pa mm. like yeah. white and my face like so when I look at my face back when I watch when I watch <laughs> oh all my, my stuff back just yeah. to see I feel like man I look really like pale and yeah. pasty mm. like where it's not my natural colour almost yeah, yeah. but it's not because I don't think it, it's not because they say I want to do it like this I think it's they don't know how to yeah mm. even like to this day finding a hairdresser outside of central London is very difficult mm. yeah that, that is tough movie, actually yeah. I was saying to you like if I haven't got my barber I can't get my hair done for weeks because there's not yeah. like... How do you think I felt when I was in Japan? My hair? In Japan! I was, in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, you know, it's kind of like, I just tried, when I was in Japan, I was just what like... What did you do? I just said, you know, just go and, you know, do like, what, just leave the top yeah. and just shape the back and do a, a fade as best as you can. <laughs> Could they do it? But it wasn't even, like, I remember I had a translator as well, so it was like, I had to speak to him for him to speak to him. And yeah. Then, no, it was kind of like that in a triangle. You have to fly your barber out. Yeah, I know, I know. It's funny because, every, you know, in, in this day and age, everyone has a barber that you just feel comfortable with. Yeah. Mm. That you're always going to go back to. I mean, my barber until recently was cutting my hair since I was about like 15. Mm. Just because I felt comfortable with him. Mm. And when I went and played away, when I went to Cardiff, I was bringing my barber from, Lo from London to Cardiff. Yeah. yeah. And just paying him like what his daily rate would be just to cut my hair. Should we turn this into the hair show? Well, we it's could, such an emotional could. thing for black people though. I don't think it is anyone it is. realizes. It's, like, it's important. It's, it's important. You know, I remember there's a movie called The Barber Shop. Have you seen it? Yeah. <laughs> and, and this guy movies. went in. The guy went into the barber shop. He didn't have no money, just to get his hair cut for a job interview. Yeah. So he looked sharp, and he ran out the barber shop. Everyone's chasing him down the road. He got <laughs> away. He, he went to the interview, got the job, came back paid the barber yeah well, but that's what it is you know it makes yeah, you yeah. feel like you know you want to feel kind of sharp and yeah mm. with like even with my hair sometimes like i mean now it's, i need a haircut now yeah you i know, know you do yeah but i mean yeah i think it, it is a big thing but this is yeah. what i'm talking about about i'll cycle back to what i said initially about the environment how mm. an older white male that environment's built for them and for me, it's all these little things in the environment that just are a little bit of an uphill battle still. But you can't say it too much because people are like, oh, you're complaining. You get your hair and makeup done. It's like, yeah, okay, I get that. But so does this person. And they don't have to deal with all of these yeah, worries and concerns and emotive issues coming to the fore, you know? Mm. How did, when, how, when did you get into broadcasting, Henny? And how did, you, how did that come, come about for you? Completely by accident. I'd say it's not 
a natural thing for me and it's something that I've actually battled with because I'm a lot more comfortable behind the camera than I am in front of it. Mm. Um, but I, when I stopped playing because of injury, my agent, she was like, do you want to go on to Sky? And I was just sitting on the sofa and I thought, yeah, sure. And so I'll sit on a different sofa and watch Gone with the <laughs> <laughs> my one at home. And I went in and um, yeah, they just asked me, just kept asking me back basically. Mm. Um, I found it kind of difficult because it was women's golf and I was retired from women's golf and that's what I wanted to play in. So mentally and emotionally, it was a little bit tough. Um, but I just thought it was a really good opportunity and they offered me a full-time contract. And at that point, it was like, do I go back to golf full-time and start from scratch and look for sponsors and build my way up and get my tour card again? And, or do I want to um, start this new career, which is a little bit more stable and settled? And Incy was very much like that. Yeah. When I spoke to her, she said the same kind of thing. It was yeah. different circumstances, but she said that she felt that going into broadcasting was much safer, mm. more security, stability. Especially in the women's game, there's just not yeah. the money. Mm. Yeah. And if you want to think about like, okay, I want a family in five years, what's the best way of... She said the same thing again, yeah. <laughs> what's yeah. the best way of doing yeah. that? Security, is yeah, it? Exactly. Golf, yeah. it's like you said, you haven't got your that constant paycheck. Unless yeah. you're at the right at the top. That's of what I mean, I think, uh, what I say, I think it's, is it tennis and golf? Yeah. It's the only sports that you don't get paid up front. Yeah. Mm. You have to earn it to yeah. have a living. Whereas, again, you know, that I could get, to... you could have a contract for like a four year contract. Yeah. If you don't play one game, you're still going to get paid for four right. years. Mm. Right. And, and again, that goes to your background. I didn't have family money to fall back on. Mm. There's some girls that I played with who have got family money and one of them was in contention and won the other day and I'm like, that's awesome. Like, you sh you're still going even despite the fact that you've had injuries and you've not had the results and you can just you know that you can just keep going whereas for me it was never that i literally had to drive to morocco once because i couldn't afford the airfare i played wow, my yeah. first tournament that i won i had five pounds left in my bank account shit man that is couldn't ridiculous. afford to keep playing that is, uh, <laughs> i can't believe that but we we was talking about that i said i mean you can tell us now that like, i honestly feel like if you come from a wealthy background that little 10 foot part your hand's not shaking because, you know, I, you know, if I miss this part, no I'm, I'm still fine. No it's the, it's the people that are coming up that yeah. are, like, not broke, but they don't have much. Mm. They're thinking, I need to get this in to get this purse. Mm. You know, it's a big difference to my life. I think in some sports that's fine, but in golf, it's a very fine balance because, like I spoke to earlier, it gave me that drive and determination. When I was out there practicing, it was for a purpose and a goal. I was always thinking about when I'm 18, I'm going to turn professional and I'm going to get out of here. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. from 12 years old. That was my sole yeah. singular focus when I was in the gym, when I, whatever I was doing, it was that tunnel vision. Yeah. If you come from a wealthy background, do you have that same tunnel? Kind of, maybe, but it's different. it's different. I know it doesn't have that same no. like guttural yeah. fear, fire attached to it. But then those players have a slight advantage, don't they? Yeah, because then when you turn professional, now that's a completely different psychology in golf and you're out there with trying to play with freedom playing for the long run playing without that stress on your shoulders mm -hmm, and i think that's when it shows up then um and it's not a question of talent it's not a question of am i good enough and then you've got all the other things that come in as well you know like time management and skills management and trying to figure out I can not afford this flight. I can't fly yeah, direct yeah, yeah. because <laughs> I've you, got to fly or I've got to drive to Morocco. Like, like, imagine the stress that's putting on your body. <laughs> and then you've yeah. got to go and compete. Go and try and play. Yeah. Yeah. You don't that. even like an hour drive and playing golf. No, I, I thought... <laughs> you, I mean, you've got some amazing courses down in Surrey. Yeah. But for me, like, I prefer, honestly, and this is just me as an amateur, I prefer to go and stay the night somewhere. Yeah. Wake up, feel relaxed. Fresh, yeah. Have breakfast. You know, that kind of way before I plan a round of golf. Otherwise, I just feel like I'm in... A rush if I get caught in traffic now I'm like shit but you know? if that's your livelihood and that's what you got to yeah. do it's, it's mad because you got that but that's my preparation for everything in life like mm. if I was going anywhere I prefer to be half an hour late than one minute early according to a friend of mine who saw somewhere with Steve Harvey who quoted this research that said that people who are late are happier and more successful that's what you was an hour late <laughs> there we right, go Steve, Har Steve Harvey it's your fault <laughs> I rest my case I'm going to start being late every time <laughs> here's a question for you because I get asked it a lot since I've retired how is retirement for you that's what I always get asked yeah. and I always say for me personally I'm good because I never had no serious injuries um, 
and I got to retire on my own terms. Mm. How was it for you mentally that you had to retire, knowing you're good enough, knowing you're better than some of the, you know, some of the players out there that you had to retire from injury? What was that like for you mentally? Yeah, at the time it was really tough. I think that was my first experience with depression. I couldn't get off the sofa, couldn't get out of bed. And I was like, what's wrong with me? I consider myself mentally tough, but I can't get it together. Um, and it took quite a while. I think it took two, three years for me to, wow. like, functioning. Mm. I was functioning, I was working, I was doing things you wouldn't have known from the outside, but it took me quite a long time to get past that. Um, and I guess the, ne the natural question is, how did I get past that? And it, therapy, I worked with a charity, the Dame Kelly Holmes Trust, who um, helped young people through sport, basically. Um, so ex-athletes would go onto a programme and you'd recruit people from shelters and um, YMCAs and whatever and help them get their lives back on track really through the like transferable skills. Mm. And so that gave me a ton of purpose but also connected me with other athletes who had recently retired, not on their terms. And so I felt I was in a community um, because Dame Kelly Holmes struggled with depression when she retired. Mm. So she'd built this incredible network. I really recommend actually anyone, they're still working, the Dame Kelly Holmes Trust. If anybody is experiencing a former athlete or thinking about retirement or experiencing retirement, that's an incredible resource um, where you get to give back as well. So I think it gets you out of your how, funk, if you like. How did you get injured? Uh, back injury. Back? Yeah. Is that is that because something happened or was it just You know, the genetic? honest answer is... Probably a smidge genetic, but mostly stress, I think, showing up in my body through various different traumas, emotional and childhood and travel and mm, mm. all of the above. Mm. And I think it just showed up eventually. My body was like, enough. Can I ask you a question? Obviously, I, you know, I don't want you to feel a certain way, but you spoke a lot about my, your mum, but what about your dad? Uh, yeah, no, that's a, oh, okay. a no-go. Yeah, okay, then, sorry. Yeah, no, you're fine. I just, I, I had a really, really, really traumatic childhood and... Um, that's a lot to do with that side of things. So no, I can understand. I yeah. mean, for me, I had a childhood, and for me, I don't mind speaking about it. I mm. mean, for others, you know, they they don't want to, and that's and that's absolutely fine for me. Yeah. You know, my real biological dad wasn't there for me. The memories I do have were physical memories with my mom, mm. um, and they were very early, so like four or five years mm. old. I don't have many memories of him. Yeah. But they're the ones I do have. Yeah. And then, my, obviously, my, my my stepdad came along who. For me, he's my dad. Yeah, like, that's cool. He raised me and took me to football and he was there for me. He helped me, you know, all throughout. And mm. that's someone I needed. But like I say, you know, some people don't want to talk about it and that's fine. Mm. Um, but for me, I, I, I like to talk about it because there's a lot of people that, I mean, my, me and my friends that can relate to me. Yeah. understand me you know yeah that was just like it's almost like uh, it's terrible to say but it's almost like normal back then no it was to your point like even mm. with my mum I there was wooden spoons broken on me like mm. the curtain rods mm. uh, you name it that was just yeah. standard yeah. which is insane I, I'm really proud of like how I parent now yeah. yeah and I think I made it my mission to yeah. do things differently and to learn how to do yeah, things I'm differently as well, 100%. and you know, like to what I said earlier about my daughter with her emotional intelligence and just seeing how confident she is. And sometimes when I see how like calm and relaxed and confident she is, I'm like, I never know how that feels. Because mm. yeah. I just never experienced that. You, you got that coming. Hmm? You got that oh. coming. Well, yeah. <laughs> but it's really cool to see. And yeah. it's, it, it fit like, but also parenting while breaking like generational trauma cycles is insanely tough. Yeah. On top of everything <laughs> this else. This is what I was saying, like, even to the point, those times I have raised my voice at my, my son and he kind of, you know, that kind of mm, shook, like scared look, yeah. that flinch. I feel really bad yeah. afterwards. Like 10 minutes later, I go to him and give him a big cuddle and a kiss and I say, I'm really sorry. You know, daddy was wrong, blah, blah, blah. That's but, really powerful in itself, yeah. though, the apology. But now, like when I speak to him, because he loves football as well, I always kind of bend down so I'm his height mm. when I speak to him because I feel like if you're standing up and always pointing down or speaking down, it almost like, he, he might feel like I'm telling him off. Yeah. So I always go down to him and speak to him like eye to eye. Yeah. It's so cool and it's so powerful. And it, I feel like it's such an honour to be able to be that person in your family that's breaking those cycles. Mm, that's amazing. how I feel about I'm pretty it. pretty satisfied with what I've got. 
<laughs> We're done. Siri agrees. <laughs> Siri, Siri agrees, agrees man. <laughs> Siri wants to wrap it up. So, Thank Eddie, you, Siri. Eddie, we have a, we have a challenge. Um, well, we hope your back's up for it. If you oh, yeah. You're yeah. Can you still hit yeah, balls? Yeah, I can hit. Can you still hit balls? Yeah. Okay, go on. You take over. This, show, this show, again, we've spoken a bit about pressure. Who can handle the pressure? Trey Cole. We've got... Let's not talk about my, my <laughs> shot. Okay. We've got our Out of Bounds <laughs> show challenge, our nearest the pin. Yeah. Okay, so we need you to take part and we need to see where you're going to be okay. on the leaderboard. What's the... Uh, Incy. Yeah. Yeah. Got to be Incy. She, she... Yeah, she... Was, she was, she two, hit it two feet, was she? She hit it two foot four inches. Unreal. In She's so good, by the she way. She did a really good I played... Do you know what's funny? I played with her in, in LA. Um, at, uh, what's it called? Trump LA. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is ridiculously hard anyway and she was like oh no you know I'm not good anymore I don't really play and I was like when I see her play I was like my god she hits she, it a mile my, yeah, I, I remember like, to wow. your question about being a young junior I played with her in the Roehampton Gold Cup and she must have only been like 12 or 13 but she was so good she hit it so far I was like jeez this girl's gonna be I actually said to her why don't you go back and try and... Yeah, she golf could. One of them, she, golf is one of those sports. It doesn't really matter about age. No. No. Do you think you could still get out and compete? It's so funny because I was Would speaking like to, to my husband recently. I could. I don't want to. Why? Do you, do you like golf still? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I Love do. Love it or like it? Oh, I have a very complicated relationship with it. Yeah. But... Um, I don't love it in the way of like... I don't love the history. I could really care less about that. I like playing it. I love the feet. When I get out there and it's just me and the golf course and my daughter or family, friends, and it's that late evening. Yeah, and like it, I love that. Yeah. Absolutely love that. Like, I, that I've for me is that the for game. The first time this, yeah. I've only done it for the first time recently. But the, I feel like you're, I said this to you, I like just going out like we did last week, just playing socially, having a bit of band between us. Yeah. But to play a tournament, there's a lot of prep. Yeah. And then you've got to go somewhere. You're probably on your own. And then you've got to play three, four rounds, practice rounds. It's a lot. Yeah. It? It's intense. Do you know what? Like, the reason that I, I don't want to is because of the, and you guys know this, the selfishness that it requires yeah. to be good at what you do. Mm -hmm. And my purpose to what we spoke about, breaking cycles, parenting, and being present, <laughs> being present is like my number one goal in life. Whether I, that's here I, with I you guys at work or with my family. I can completely, I completely understand what you're saying because I have a, I have, I have a 20 year old as well. Mm. And obviously he came about when I was just turning 20. Yeah. And I couldn't be the dad I am today with my five year old because I had so much tunnel yeah. vision. You had to. I had to, it's like, can I, you know, I, I used to have him every other weekend when we was playing home games. Mm. I would have him on the holidays like Easter, you know, six weeks holidays will be together. But during the season, Good. I was really bad at yeah. it. And even sometimes when he came over, like we, we would play Saturday and Wednesday, right? So if he said to me, let's go out on Sunday. You had to rest. I was yeah. resting, I was recovering. I'd be like, just, just play the computer. Let's watch mm. a movie kind of thing. Mm. I wasn't able to do the school run. Yeah. You know, none of those things. Cause I was living away, I was moving around. So it was, it was really difficult. Um, but luckily I got a second chance with yeah. Five year old. It's interesting though, because like that is what makes you who you are, that wanting to be the best at everything that you're doing, right? So you wanted to be the best footballer you could at the time. And you've transferred that now to wanting to be the best dad you can. Yeah. That's, my, that's that, the best part of my day. Yeah. yeah. School run. I was thinking, um, I'm going to the open next week and I was in two minds whether to bring my daughter. I used to travel with her mm. the first year that she was mm. born because I didn't want to be away from her and then a little bit in the second year. And now it's to the point where, like, if she's there, I'm so torn between wanting to be at the golf course yeah. and do my prep and everything that that entails mm. and wanting to be back with her. And so in order to be the best I can be at that job and that role, I know I can't have her there. Yeah. It's really hard. But then I'm like, actually, that's what makes me who I am. I want to be the best at whatever it is I'm doing. So whether that's broadcasting, playing golf, or being a parent. And so I have to choose and you've got to make choices and you've got to live with those choices. Yeah. So if I, like right now, I choose her and broadcasting. So those, I, I'm happy with the balance that that provides. Yeah. Whereas if I were to play golf professionally, would I would not yeah, would be happy be, with yeah, that balance. It would be, it would be way thrown out. Yeah. Yeah. Challenge. 
Let's do right. it. You ready? Right. Who do you think is down here? <laughs> I'm pointing at Trey. Can't do it for no, sure. man, let's not, let's not get into that one. <laughs> Seven foot three. You sure you need the warm up? What is it? <laughs> Two foot. Two foot four inches into here. You can see you can see the competition coming through. <clears> right <throat> You're so That straight. should be money. Be there money. Go. You want to take oh, this one? Mate. <laughs> five nine. It's not getting Penny, these are warm ups. You got. You, you ready? Five, four, you know? Yeah. You ready now? Are you? I'm second place. Uh, okay. Ready. Okay. Right, shot one. We're warmed up. That's it. This is straight acid. That's the one. Straight acid. Gonna cut into that hole. Oh, Good start. stop it. Seven. 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 <laughs> Two more. Oh, I get three yeah, more. Yeah, three yeah, shots. Three goes. Oh, three shots. Three. You know, she's a pro. She can handle pressure. Yeah, not like me. Pretend. Yeah. I have to say, I want to so go out in the course with you. Oh, wow. Ah, oh, seven, seven foot ten, it rolls left. Don't worry about it, it's difficult to get in the fives. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't have this. Right. Come on, this is the one. Oh, I think I put like it too this? hard. There was a bit too much anger in there. Spin. Sit. Oh, that's good. Sit. Spin. Sit. Spin. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Four foot eleven. Well done. I was not having that. Oh, well, I was that. Having that. I'm disappointed now. Come on. <laughs> well, Henny, he didn't even get his on the green. Mm, yeah, we'll not talk. We'll not talk. <laughs> the the worst my? thing is. Five. Four foot. Four foot eleven. Yeah. The worst thing is, Henny, we did, did it on the first one, so me, Jay, and Ray. We come in and we did the first episode. Are you making excuses? And we just... It's Are you just, making excuses? Yeah. Well, me and Ray got on. Yeah, but it's just there for the whole season. The whole season. Well, I'm going to have to be able to I redo say? that at some point. Coaching as well is something you're getting into, isn't it, honey? It is. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it so Are you far. you enjoying it? Yeah. Yeah, the reason I wanted to do it is because I felt like I spent all my time over the last eight years focusing on that top 1% of professional golfers. And... I didn't feel like I was particularly in touch. I feel like I had a ton of knowledge that I wasn't using to help people. And yeah. my main driver and motivator beyond anything else is helping people. That's what love you know, that. Love that. I like to do, think I'm doing in broadcasting. I'm helping the viewers experience. Mm. If that's your way of relaxing and that's mm. what you love. My sole thing when I'm doing an interview or when I'm broadcasting is that I'm hopefully helping you to enjoy or to hear from your favorite golfer or whatever that mm. may look like. Um, and so, yeah, I just really wanted to start helping people. Mm. So I've got like a special rate for young elite players coming up. It's a mentorship service that I can really help. And I lo absolutely love that Have you got a special so rate far. for poor people? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Sweet>. <laughs> if that's your situation, get in touch. <laughs> you know where I am. Um, yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it actually, just yeah. like using the knowledge because it just feels like it's all stored in my brain and it's and not going it anywhere. It yeah. yeah, and I've learned so much spending time with the world's best players, mm. especially Tiger, like over the last eight years. It's been my knowledge now to your question of like going back to play golf. Mm. I would do things so differently now yeah. and my knowledge is so much greater than what it was when I was playing. I always think that if you give your younger self some advice, like especially doing lots of coaching, and stuff, I would do things so differently mm. just because of what I know now. And it's like, why did the coach, when I was younger, not tell me this sort of stuff? It's like, play play more golf on the course and like not obsess over things like on the think, range too so much. Just would, like, Would you say that like golfers become better with age then? Yeah. No because they seem more intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. You wise in it. Like, I think there's just so much more information out mm. there as well. Even if you don't go and see a coach and you just want to like watch videos on YouTube or read mm. books, mm. we know so much more now about human performance than we did back then. Like yeah. back then it was have some Jaffa cakes and a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jelly beans. Z like hard Zane work. was telling me actually um, that when like he turned pro and he started getting better he was so much like technique technique yeah but when he was a kid he was just chipping comps and and he yeah. said he was like so sharp and stuff then 
and then it's like you turn pro and you start doing all these different things to try and get find them small one percenter. So part of me says, yeah, you would. You just kind of when you're young, you just do it, mm -hmm. and you you you're quite susceptible to performing and getting good. But then when you get older and get wiser, there's part of you that's that would do things differently. Yeah. But then it can ruin you as well because you obsess over things. Like you, we spoke about this while we was in Scotland, but like my course management is awful. But from an amateur's point of view, like it's true. Like we just think about hit the fairway, hit the green. Mm. You know, you don't think about the dangers or you know where you want to put the ball. You just think about the absolute basic. So that is exactly what I do in coaching. I don't really coach technique. I coach people how to score. Yeah. So to take everything that you've worked on with your coach and everything that you're, whatever, even if you don't have a coach, even if you're just like, your game, I just take your game, your thoughts, who you are, what you're working you on, <laughs> and I make you score better. So I've had someone, I just spoke to a client today on the way up here, he was like, I've turned a corner, I'm so much happier. Because when you're playing bad golf, if you love and you're passionate about that, that's your hobby, it filters over into your life and... Yeah. It's, yeah, it's plenty stressful. of times I've gone home and my, my mom is like, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm yeah. going to so this, like, And this is what I mean. I'm so passionate about it because I helped him. He's playing 10 times. Like, I've turned a corner. Uh, come and see you again next Feel month. Good, Brilliant. Don't you? Feels so good. Yeah, feels yeah good. I, definitely, um, I definitely need to do that. Mm. Yeah, come I see me. Need to. I definitely will. It's free though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 big, big cat is someone who wants to talk I about. Mean, I know Jay wants to talk about I'm the big cat as well. I, I, to be honest, that's when I, I first knew about I didn't know about golf yeah. until Tiger came out. Yeah. And there was some shabby, I, I mean, I've said this now on this show how many mm. times, but there was some shabby driving range at um, King's Cross. And you know, you just all I could see was like a really high net. And I remember saying to my dad, like, what's that? And he was like, that's a driving range. I said, so Tiger would practice in something like that. <laughs> He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. And then yeah. that's when I started like kind of noticing golf when Tiger, Tiger changed the sport. Yeah, without you know, question. He put, he put it on the map for the masses. But I, I mean, we're going to talk about Tiger, but for me, I want to ask you as well. Like for me, I grew up in London. Again, Paul, how, how do you think we can make or, you know, make golf more accessible to the masses, more enjoyable? Mm. Um, because a lot of people you know we've spoken to a lot of people a lot of people don't want to take it up because they might have to buy certain clothes to wear to a golf club mm. Um, mm. things are a little bit expensive um, and it's not that enjoyable I mean I love golf but when I put it on the TV after about 10-15 minutes I'm, free, I'm sleeping yeah that's because not when Henny's on boring. no 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 not when, <laughs> Henny's on, not when Henny's on but I just feel it doesn't captivate me like I yeah. look at golf mm. and it's it, it, it's, it's a competition, not an event. That's why I think live yeah. is good for golf because I went to um, the tournament the other day at Centurion and you go there, the music's on while they're teeing off. It's more of an, ev of an event yeah. than a competition. Yeah. And I think that's the way golf should be. I think more people will take up golf if it was more like that. Mm. Yeah, I think the culture has to drastically change. But, and I keep saying this, I don't think golf really wants to change. I don't think it's prepared to change to really let in the people that you need to in order to grow the game properly. Because in order to do that, you can't have a dress code. Yeah. Number one. And I say that and people are like, ah! and I'm like, yeah, okay, then, then you're not ready. Yeah. You're not ready. If that's, it, if that's yeah. how we start the conversation and that's your response, you yeah. don't want to grow the game. Yeah. The end. <laughs> that, that, is that, true. that is true. It's true. I remember you, used to, you know, back in the day, I used to go to nightclubs and it'd be like, you, you've got to wear shoes. And straight away, going. I'm like, I'm not going to come in then. No. I'm not going to go and buy shoes because that's not my style. Yeah. Mm. And look, I know we're all Adidas, but like I, any, any partnership that I do has to be authentic yeah. and to what I believe in. And I can wear Adidas golf clothes and go from the school drop off to the dog walk to the golf course to the gym. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back to the school pickup, all in my golf clothes. Yeah. Yeah. But golf, Adidas to me, is a lifestyle brand. Yeah. Like you could, I could go, like you said, I could go and just put an Adidas jacket on, but then I could walk into a nightclub and the people are like, that's cool, man. Where you get it? You know, yeah. Yeah. what shop do you get that that's jacket from? Like or what it. country? And it's like, it's cool. Whereas I look at other brands, sports brands, you know, and I, like, I, I mean, I'll say Nike. Mm. If I see someone walk into a club in a Nike, you know, zip up or whatnot, I'm going to say, why are you wearing like, it doesn't look right to me. Mm. Jordan's different. You know, and, and Travis Scott now, things like that are different. But I just feel like 
Nike athletic, if you want to call it, it's not cool. But imagine regular golf clothes going to a nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to name not brands, yet. but... I, listen, I, they, 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 <laughs> um, Adidas Ultra Boost golf shoes, I've been wearing them like trainers. Me too. I wore yeah. them through the... I travelled in them. <laughs> I wore them through the airport. Like yeah, I because then I don't have to gym. pack. <laughs> <laughs> I can run in them. I don't have to pack another pair of yeah, shoes. Exactly. Yeah. That's ideal. So, I mean, I think, they're just, I think Adidas in particular is just like... They are really trying to change golf as much as they can. Like a hoodie. We was in Scotland the other day and it was started bucketing down. And like it, it was a good thing that I had a hood on my top. I'm wise. Gotta protect the my head. head. Yeah. <laughs> we was with this, like, this small Scottish guy called Archie. I looked at him, I was like, mate, do you wanna wear my hoodie? And he's like got he's drenched. He's running yeah. Yeah. Place, yeah. I, he ended up taking my jumper in the end, didn't he? Yeah, but But I think okay, yes, on a practical level, look, you wanna be able to go everywhere with it, but if you're growing up poor, you can't afford to buy new golf clothes. Yeah. So if that's the entry, then that's all. If that's the barrier, take out take equipment yeah. that's already too high. The second thing is, if I see people, if I go anywhere, right, let's say I'm wearing a hoodie into a ballroom, I don't feel comfortable. I'm not going to be in there. And that's essentially what you have at golf clubs. Yeah. If there's a really strict dress code and I'm a poor kid and I'm wearing whatever I can wear and piece together... Mm. I'm not going to feel comfortable. I, I, I don't want to be there. I was thinking about this. You know, um, there's a couple of people that we know that have been to clubs um, not far away from here, actually, and they've had all these hoodie thing and, like, socks, got to change your shop, socks and stuff. And then somebody was saying, like, I, w I wanted to have an opinion on that and voice that online. But then somebody's saying, like, what if you've ever got to go there and work or do something there in the future? And I'm thinking, like, I don't think I'd want to go there anyway mm. if I've got to change this and change that and change that. I don't think I'd want to well, go Well, what there. you said just now, like, I've been invited to some, you know, society days and things like that. And then as soon as they say to me, oh, afterwards there's a dinner, but you have to jacket wear a black yeah. jacket yeah, and like, tie. I ain't coming no. then. No, I, 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 yeah, I can't make it today. That's not essential to enjoying the game. Mm. Have your history. Yes. Mm -hmm. Revere the history. Fine. But we're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. If people want to... Nowadays, people in general life still like to dress up smart and wear their shirt and tie. And cool, that's they fine. But if I want to... You do you. If I want to wear a hoodie next year, I can do that, right? In the streets. Mm. Why can't that be the same at a golf co club? I'm not stopping you. By the way, loud, Larry trousers look ten times worse than a hoodie <laughs> ever will. So yeah. to how it looks, 100%. your point there is like... I think sorry, like golf no. etiquette, like on the course... Great. On Me the course, wearing a hoodie on the course. isn't going to affect exactly. my ability to rake a bunker. Exactly, friend. 100%. Like, I was really but angry about I, it. I really like what you said there, like golf doesn't want to change. No. At the start, it doesn't. It's almost really. getting pushed like it has to. They don't really want to, it has to. It and doesn't have to right now, but when slowly. it will get to a point where it does have to. Mm. And it probably won't change until it does actually have to, mm. in my opinion, sadly. But, hey, look, there's pockets of us out there trying yeah, desperately why, to change it. A, a lot of people don't like to answer this question, but I will, I'll have to ask it. But do you think Liv has been good for golf then? I think any time you have um, competition in business, it's good for the business. So if I have a bakery and there's no other bakery in the street or the town or within 20 miles, I can do whatever I want. Get complacent I could have a well. terrible donut and you'd think it's fine. <laughs> Mm. Not saying PJ Tour was a terrible donut, but mm. I'm just saying, I, if a bakery opens down the street, now all of a sudden I've got to put my prices up or down, or sorry, I've got to put my prices down, I've got to increase the quality of my product. Competition, yeah. because that's And for the PJ Tour right? players, that's what we've seen. They've increased purses, and it's. I just think in any business, let's take out, I don't like to get, we get so narrow minded in golf, of like the golf ecosystem. But take it outside of that, go business. Is a competitor good for business? Yes. Yes. That's like in sport even. If you've got no competitors in sport, mm -hmm. you get complacent. Yeah. You don't have to raise your game anymore. Yeah. Absolutely. If you go and train with 28 handicappers, you're probably not going to get better. If you train with pros, you're going to raise your game. That's why I like playing with you, like just to see you play. And you know, I'm sure when I play with you, mm -hmm. Henny, and I've played with Incy and people like that, Josh White, when I see you guys play, it makes me feel like, okay, I know what I want to aspire to yeah. get to. I might not get there, but I know where I want to get to. There's mm. a direction I can see something that I'm mm. working towards. Whereas if I'm being playing with people worse than me, and I'm the best, I can get comfortable. Yeah. I don't yeah. have to try. And I think, look, the morality of it, do I like women's rights or LGBTQ plus rights in that country? No, I don't. But 
I don't like a lot of the rights that they have for women in America. So where do you draw the line? If I was going to draw the line every time of like, I'm never going to buy a product that has investment from countries or places with poor human rights records. Uh, yeah, that's incredible. If someone could do that, unreal. And, you know, I would have an insane amount of respect for someone who could do that. I think that would be incredibly tough because sometimes you just don't know. Mm. And we sh I'm trying to raise my awareness as a consumer of what I'm buying and how that's impacting the planet and people. And if there's um, a product that positively impacts the environment or the community, I will spend more on that. Do you eat meat? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying so, to get him. I'm, I'm trying to get him away from the dark side. Yeah. You wouldn't, I don't think I could. <laughs> you can. I like that steak too much. Oh yeah. no! Think about the cow. Oh, taste, They're so intelligent. They're like dogs. The... Cows. Preach, Henry. Give me more. Give me Henry, more. preach. Bro, preach. preach. Hit it forty past you. You know what's funny? You know when we talked about our kids. Yeah. My, my son was like that. He was like, um, I said, you know, if you want to eat chicken, you can. You can. You can. Yeah. It's up to you. He's like, no, because I don't want to hurt the chicken. Yeah. I thought. oh. Like, really that kind of melt with my heart almost. Yeah. My daughter cares about does chicken. eat chicken. Mm. Oh, well, I won't have her eat red meat. If she wants to eat that like outside or if we're at a mm. restaurant she wants to try it when she's older, fine. I'm not going to like impose things on her. But um, me and my husband are very clear that like that chicken you're eating is one in the same as the one that you're petting at the farm or the one that you like on TV. Like they're the it's same true, thing yeah. and we're not sugarcoating that. And if you want to make a choice and a decision moving forward about that, I have to say you that, put fine. things so... In I, I love the way you speak. You put things in such a good like thought like you make you make it easy for, I'm going to take some of your quotes <laughs> for myself because it's so it's so easy you make it so understanding and simple any parents in school yeah really really <laughs> really really good I'm a big overthinker though like I think through everything I'm not even an overthinker I'm a good deep thinker like I, I consider everything which is exhausting sometimes yeah I but don't yeah. it I results do in like shopping. me being come through the other side of that to like simplify it I need to do that more, to be honest. Oh, Without being self-critical, I need to think. Gotta get that. On that yeah, to yeah. Do this, I don't. I just like even when I go shopping, I'm not. Even, That's amazing. I don't, even, I don't even want to say it out loud, but I don't really look at the prices. I look at what I want. Yeah. Mm. You know, sometimes there's better value in. It's not. But for me, I just kind of go. I want that. I want that. I want that. You know, we're in the airport yesterday. And I was coming back. I was like in the sweet aisle, like for the to get home. I'm like. I really weigh up what I want to eat on the way back, like what sweets do I want this and chocolate. And then you chose them ones that... Like on the satisfaction <laughs> level. Open, he chose this yeah. sweetie, I was like eating, I was like, I couldn't even open my drawer, they were so sticky. Glue. It was like glue, yeah. Pop it. The lady, the lady come past on the aisle and she was like, do you, do, do you want anything? I was like, can I have a toothpick? <laughs> <laughs> I was in tears. That was too funny. It was funnier than it should have no, been. No, I'm ben. a firm believer that you've got to go with who you are. Henny, it's a superpower to not uh, not deep think thing and just imagine how quick you are in the supermarket. It takes me like three hours know, to do my weekly shop. Honestly, it takes me about half hour. Love that. No, nah, I couldn't do it. Stay yeah, with no, that. I couldn't do that. Um, when did you first? Okay, we go tiger. I've got to yeah. speak about. When did you yeah. first start speaking to Tiger and like interviewing him and do media work with Tiger? When was that? Oh, when was that? Um, four years. Where are we now? 2019 yeah 2019 right. I, what was that like had you spoke to him before did you like before yeah, that yeah I'd interviewed him at um the Quicken Loans in Bethesda um yeah look yeah he was my idol but then I think I think um idol to good friends that's just amazing I think yeah that's yeah, amazing. it was super unexpected. Like me and him both say, didn't it, we didn't expect to have the friendship that we have. Yeah. You don't know what it's like. Going, he didn't know probably what I was going to be like going into it. I didn't know what he was going yeah. to be like. Um, but very quickly, I think we just had this like connection. I'd say our friendship is like big brother, annoying mm. little sister. And that's just how it was straight off the bat. I was thinking back to like one of the first interviews and I'm giving him shit for being an old man and having to be an old <laughs> for ages and like it's just it, we just fell into that so fast and it was just easy um and he I think he I wanted to give him the respect that he deserved and so I worked really hard to 
give him that the platform that I knew that he needed a lot of it was very like like when I did the master's interview mm. the sit down one for I think it was like half an hour afterwards I, I prepped for like I think it was two weeks after so I prepped that whole time and like really thought about it I had my family over to visit and overthinking it not overthinking, no. I don't want really to, I want think... to take that word off the table. I'm a, I, and I, was, I deep corrected thinker. myself. I deep, I'm a deep thinker. Okay. So I deep think into something and then I'll lay back on it and just let it like yeah, come out. through and play mm, out. Yeah. And then I deep think on it again and come out of it. And it's often when you're like walking the dog or on yeah, a drive or something. Because I've deep thought on it, something else will come through. And I'm like, oh yeah, I like that. I've so much like a, a process now. I say that to you, like I love breakfast, but when I wake up in the morning, I wake up early generally. Mm. And I like to just sit down, the TV off, yeah. don't look at my phone, and I just like think about what I want to do in meditating. my day. It's, it's not meditating. It I, is, I, isn't it? It's not really meditating. No, because meditating is like when you focus on a, nothing, mm, like <laughs> breath or. Oh, okay. I, 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 I or don't movement. think like if I, I have not tried to thoughts. meditate before, you know, I really have. Yeah. I've really tried, and it, you know, like I set the the timer to how long I could meditate yeah. for. It felt like about half an hour, but it was like <laughs> 40 like, seconds. Yeah. yeah. It's hard. Just because I, 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 it, it doesn't is hard. feel right to me. It's hard, yeah. But even like it's someone... a skill in it. It's a skill. Mm. Yeah, it's a skill. it is. It is. It is. It's, it's got... something that's got to be practiced a lot. And there's different types of meditation. I've been meditating since my early 20s. Um, and there's walking meditation, there's sound meditation, there's sitting meditation. There's different ones if you're the type of person that can't sit still. But I love nothing more than sitting still. I love I being I definitely really, like it on a really, Sunday. really still. I like it on a Sunday. Yeah. And I get my Sunday roast and then oh, get back oh, on a Sunday. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly Sunday. It's nearly Sunday. Yeah. But why? Why do you think? Like, I mean, you met him. You you clicked, like you said. But why do you think he gave you that kind of access? Because Tiger don't speak to many people, but obviously he he's giving you that access and he's giving you a platform for you mm. to, you know, elevate yourself. Because you know, if I say to you. If I say to someone, you know, I'd love to meet Tiger or speak to Tiger or whatever, they'd probably say, do you know Henny? Yeah. Mm. Well, I think it was the right time for him. You know, a lot of these guys, the only time that they get to speak is at a press conference. Mm. And the journalists already have their story prepared and they're just looking for a quote. Yeah. So true, I think yeah. a lot of the golfers feel misunderstood and misrepresented and... I think the advent of like social media and podcast, all these different mediums that golfers can like get their thoughts, celebrities in general can get their thoughts and feelings out. Um, to clarify, I'm not putting myself in that bracket whatsoever. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just think it's a really nice, it, it comes, it's a double-edged sword again, because, you know, you've got this unparalleled access to you. But I think for him, when he signed the deal with Discovery, it was to be able to represent himself in a way, just get to let people know him. Mm. And I think it was just the right time because during his playing career, when he was at his prime and his height, that wasn't the right time for that. We've had the chance to do that. Um, so yeah, I think it was like right time and right place for me. Like I just got divorced from my first husband and I was single and I was all focusing on my career and I was mm. at a time when I could move to America. Um, yeah, it was, I think it was just like timing. good timing. Mm. Mm. That's, amazing. that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, what's like you at? You said, mentioned they're moving to America. That culture compared mm. to UK culture. What's yeah. that? What's that like? Did you like your time there? Um, I learnt a lot, and it was very insightful. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really weird. Firstly, it's a really weird time. It was a really weird time to be there because it was during the Trump what administration. Side? Oh, where was you living? Sorry, I was in um, northeast Florida. Okay. Very year and a half and then I was in Arizona for a year and a half so I experienced both yeah. coasts. Mm. Yeah look it was a very divisive time for America um, and so Trump administration, George Floyd murder, riots, there was a lot going on. Um, it's a really um, extreme capitalist society which I'm Buddhist so um, it's sort of an odds of like my belief system. But this um, is all about peace, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, yeah. It's about like not striving and um, being present and understanding that everything's interconnected and not having a big emphasis on material possessions. Right. 
um, non-attachment, essentially, is what it would be phrased as. Yeah. Um, and so the interesting, insightful part for me was twofold. One, in that, like, in your 20s, you're, like, striving constantly to become the person that you want to be, get the job you want to have, the relationship you want to have. It's all about, I want, I want, I want, I want. Um, and then I think America takes that to the next level. And so it was at my late 20s, and I, I'd always had a thing about the house, right? That was always my thing. Mm. And the, never mind the shoes, the watches, the cars, whatever. It's yeah. just always the, the house. house is most, you know, the nest. Right. Mm. And so eventually I had that, I had the house, but I was really miserable because when you have the house, then you have to maintain the house. And you don't think about that part. You don't do you? think no. about that, that part when you were signing the car when you're like, yeah, I got it. then you've got to maintain it. And I got to the point where I was working across all the major networks in America. I had four different roles. I was a new mum, had a great relationship. I still have. Um, had the house, had the Tesla, had the everything. Mm. You name it. In terms of like in 20s it. me, the like box mm. ticking tick, tick off. Like, yeah. boom, boom, boom. But I realised that's not what I wanted. And it was really insightful because I was travelling all the time. I wasn't, my main goal, which was to be present, I couldn't achieve it because I had to travel and I had to work to maintain the house and the lifestyle and the, mm. and there's so much opportunity in America, which is insane. But I just felt like I was on this hamster wheel that I couldn't get off. And I didn't have a life balance that was maintainable for me. For me. Like, I love being still. I like being slow. I have a morning perimeter walk around my garden to look at all my flowers. And like, I love that. I love just sitting there with my daughter and having a cup of tea and just watching her play and not needing to do anything. I'll block time off in my weekly diary. If you ask me, like, on this day and time, are you busy? I'll tell you yes, <laughs> because I'm doing nothing. I'm busy doing nothing. And that's really important to me. When it's funny you said that. that I was saying to you that... A couple of weeks ago, my phone just broke on a Friday mm. afternoon, and um, I thought you died. Yeah, <laughs> I died, thought you yeah. died. <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have. I didn't have my phone for the whole weekend. Yeah. But in actual fact, it was nice. Yeah. Really so I said to myself, especially when I go on holiday now, yeah, I'm gonna try and just not touch my phone. I'm gonna look at my phone in the morning. Yeah. Lunchtime and then in the evening. But apart from that, I'm not going to like have my scrolling, phone looking and scrolling yeah. on Instagram. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to try and yeah. get away from it. And then, you know, that's my first step. And then I want to get to a point where on the weekends, I don't look at my phone at all. Yeah. But it's, it's going to be, it's gonna be yeah, challenging. Yeah, no, sometimes it's just like, for me, it's just like leaving the phone down, putting on an airplane mode come like six o'clock. Yeah. You don't need me after six. I like, I'm putting that in my kitchen on charge, just not going upstairs, and then I'm not looking at it first thing in the morning. I'm just going to be present. But I think blocking that time off. So uh, the point is that, that that lifestyle that I was leading was completely at odds with how I deep down felt I needed to live. And so we sold up and packed up and majorly downsized because I was like, I just want... But you're happier. So mm. much happier. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So when you went to Florida, was you spending a lot of time with Tiger then? Because obviously, I, I believe he lives in Florida, right? Yeah, uh, mostly at tournaments. Yeah. He, I'm North Florida and he was like South Florida. Um, but yeah, sometimes I was just thinking actually, it's like weird because we spent so much time together, like I knew when I'd always see him. Um, yeah, it's weird like not seeing him as much now, but... Yeah, every every tournament round we'd speak to him post round and yeah. That, that out. sorry sorry Trey that aura he had to you when you first met him does he still have that aura for you now? No, no. no. I remember like when I first met him when I was like sixteen. I ran, I sprinted out onto the furthest part of the course at Wentworth, and he <laughs> That's what was I up onto a tee, <laughs> and he just had this like almost like glow celestial around glow <laughs> around him. And People I was just around. Like, ah. <laughs> So cool. Um, and then now, just yeah, like, no. Just, just your <laughs> no, mate. Yeah. Is he just another guy to you now, really? Yeah, this, yeah. This is the coolest friend. photo ever, by the way. Oh, yeah. Me with... Uh, what were you laughing at? <laughs> Isn't that? I don't remember. Chilling. That is proper Probably chilling. Some nonsense. <laughs> but you know, you know what, when I... Because obviously, I mean, to my, Tiger, to me, when I see him, he's just... In golf, he's definitely... A hero, someone I'd like, I, I kind of idolise, I would say. Yeah. Um, but he had a lot of 
turbulent times, a lot of injuries as well. Yeah. Was you able to sympathise with him with his injuries? Could, did yes. you give him advice in that part? That was a big thing that we bonded on was our back injuries. I think yeah. just like me being able to understand the feeling like of what he was going through when he stepped mm. out of a car and couldn't walk and like just some of the like mental difficulties of having to prep for hours when someone else could just like roll onto a range. Yeah. Um, and he's been like really amazing. Like he'll give, like he'll send me stretches and advice and like, mm -hmm. because he understands and he's been there and done that. And there's almost just like that unspoken it's understanding. It's good to have that brain to pick, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he's, such, he's amazing at advice. Like his perspective on a variety of different things he, is looked, really cool. I mean, I love watching him play even now, but he always, like now when I watch him play, he always looks like he's in pain. And mm. I think when you're in pain and you're trying to win and you're trying to concentrate, that's like the worst thing. Um, to be honest, I'm glad he's stepping back now and he said that he's going to just, you know, try and concentrate on the majors and not play as many tournaments. But read, like, I, I, quite, I like to read as well and hearing him speak, to me it sounds like as much as he's going to take a step back from tournaments, he's still going to be practising and training because that was what he's always done. That's yeah, his knows. mental toughness is second to none. But second to none, mental. it's insane. Did you ever talk about like, the greatest shot in golf in history? No. You never spoke to him about that when he just chipped it and he's like looking and looking. And it just... You love that shot, don't you? Oh, Do you? That shot. <laughs> I, can't, like, I can't get bored of that shot. shot. The rolling yeah, one, yeah. yeah. Iconic. Um, right, just to start to wrap things up, we got a question from a uh, junior golfer yeah. uh, that we have on, and she asked you a question. Love I got this. it in voice note, actually. She's got to make sure it's the right, the right one. Also, how do they balance the golf practice with everything else? Okay, maybe that's a question for you when you was playing. She did ask another one. Uh, what was the thing that helped you most in the competitions, such as training or well-being, or was it the equipment or advice that you had before the competition? How old is she? Uh, that's Bailey. Um, Rose, she won't mind me saying her name. Uh, I believe she's I'm not gonna know off the top of my head. She sounds young. Yeah, she's seven. I love that I she's saying she's asking about well-being at seven. <laughs> that <laughs> rock star moves. <laughs> I believe she, I think she's seven. She's you I know what? Even her. that in that void though, she sounds determined. Yeah. Those are firstly, Bailey, those are great questions. Um I think in terms of training, I would say just to play as much as you can, hit it as hard as you can, <laughs> and just have fun. Yeah. Those yeah. are the three requisites. If ever you're practicing or training, just make sure you're hitting one of those marks. If you're on the range, hit it as hard as you can. Keep things simple. Don't need like five coaches. <laughs> just keep things simple. And, and the reason that you don't need those coaches is because the one thing to develop as you're growing up is your sense of self. I can't answer the question on the balance mm. because that's your sense of self. Yeah. Like some people want to spend every single second at the golf club and want to practice all the time and that will be their balance and other people don't want that. You just want to dip in and out for an hour or two and that's your yeah. balance. So my big advice is to just find what works for you and just <coughs> hold on to that for dear life. And if someone says something that doesn't match with that, just thanks, but no thanks. Okay. Do you think Tiger can break the record for majors one? A tiger can do anything. A tiger can run five marathons. I will never, as long as I've got breath in my body, bet, bet against that guy. Do you think it would be on a specific course that doesn't require him being able to hit, like, hit the ball long? More like, because before, when he was growing up, obviously he was hitting the ball much mm. further than everyone else. Now, you know, it's, you know, the pack's caught up with him, yeah. probably because of his body. But now when I see him play, it seems like he's, he plots his way around. He's very intelligent on the mm. course. And those like little intricate shots, those, part in, those parts, it, it seems like he's still above the rest. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I couldn't say like the specifics of when or where or what elements it would happen mm, in because he's so well. unique in terms of his mental toughness. Mm. He would literally run through a wall to make <laughs> something happen. Like, that's how he thinks and who he is. And I think, I'm not just saying this because I'm his friend, but 
probably because I am and I know how mentally tough he is, but like the only thing I can say is I just wouldn't bet against him. No. Ever. Don't bet against bet. Tiger. <laughs> don't do it. I don't do it. Never do I really, it. really would love him to. Yeah, yeah look, maybe it won't happen, maybe it will, but I'm not gonna put my money against him. <laughs> he he said he's gonna beat it, didn't he? I I, I see an interview and he said, <clears> um, do you think you're um something like do you think you're gonna get close to it? And he was like, No, I think I'm gonna surpass it. Mm. And I think that that in itself is like don't mental toughness, him. confidence. Mm. Don't bet against him, Jay. <laughs> and do you reckon you can make an introduction one day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> never, never say never. Who knows? Right time, right place. Brilliant. Thanks for coming on, honey. Thank honey, you for having me. Thanks for the story. It's been this really has good. Been fun. I loved it, to be honest. I yeah. loved it. I'm definitely going to have... I've learned some things off you as well. Yeah. We're going to we're gonna have to play meditate. golf. We're definitely going to have to play golf. Definitely. No question. We've got to get you in for a lesson as well. <laughs> yeah, Cheers, honey. Thank you. Thank you.